did. Uh, I don't even have to make you do it again. That was really good. <laughs> All right, so I have a couple of announcements for you, but one I want to celebrate first. Um, we have been in, we're in two weeks into a three week challenge right now. It's called the Transfigured 21 Day Challenge, um, and it's uh, revolving around reading Pastor Tommy's most recent book, Transfigured. And we're about to enter our final week. So it has been incredible. We are still having people added to the group. Like this week, we had people added, and we're halfway through. Um, and so we're up to about 250 people, and I just want to say, like, the beginning of this, yeah, you can clap for that, <laughs> 250 people, and before we started this, um, it was actually a conversation of, like, who, you know, how many people we wanted to join, or we were praying for um, to be involved in this, and uh, Pastor Kelly, actually, she was like, my goal is 200, like, I would love to see it get to 200, and Pastor Tommy responded, and he's like, I'm thinking 250, it was like an auction, <laughs> and I just was like, God's gonna just show up and do amazing things, and he did, and he still is, like, this group is incredible, and we've reached 250, so we've reached that, like, goal that we had, and it's still growing, um, and I just wanted to celebrate that because it has been so fruitful. And I don't know how many of you are reading along with it in the challenge. So most of you. So have you, do you agree it's been pretty fruitful the last few weeks? Yeah. So I am so excited to finish out this last week. And thank you for writing an incredible book because we all love it. So there's my celebration. And now for some calendar things. So I know last week I announced a Save the Weekend, basically, for Trunk or Treat, for Fall Festival. Um, it's October 1st, so we are full-fledged into all the fall things this, uh, this month. And I finally have dates and times for you. And I don't, I don't think these will change. So Fall Festival is going to be on the 29th instead of Fire on the 5th. Um, we have a lot going on this month, so we decided to not have uh, fire on the 5th. However, we will be here, and we will be celebrating together as a family. So that's going to be at 4 p.m., so that's a Sunday is when Fall Festival is. And then the day before, Saturday, which is the 28th, um, the city has trick-or-treat happening from 6 to 8 p.m. So we, as a church, and whoever would like to participate, um, we're going to be in the parking lot doing trunk-or-treat. And we see our whole community come through the parking lot when we do this. So if you'd like to participate, it's free. You can just join us, dress up, get your car all decorated, and we'll hand out candy and love on the people in our community. And that is all I have for the calendar. So now, Pastor Tommy. Good morning. How are you? Yeah? Do you want to get into the word? John chapter 3, verse 16. It's coming fast. It's going to come at you hard. And it's going to be full of truth. Is that okay? Okay. You guys need to wake up. I just got back from Nashville. Everybody's loud in Nashville. They all have hearing loss from amplifiers and snare drums. I need more, I need more volume. That's the problem. I need more volume and I need more bass. Is that it? Check one. Check two. Check one. John chapter three, verse 16. Say amen when you're there. All right, so today um, we're actually doing a series to go along with the Transfigured Challenge, and I'm not preaching what's in the book, I'm not preaching what I've preached before, I'm, I'm giving you some insight into the process of transfiguration. The title of today's message is, It Is Written, and I've, I've taught something similar before, but I'm going to give you some practicality and some depth that maybe you've never seen, and what I want to do first is, is position this message in such a way that you understand the depth, the volume, the magnitude of understanding this very principle, okay? <laughs> I'm going to read something to you from Romans. I didn't tell you to go to the wrong place, I promise. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 says this. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Ready? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Pretty straightforward, right? If you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live, right? Jesus, when he came in John chapter 10, he said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundant. As a matter of fact, when it said that he revealed God's intention from before the foundation of the world, he brought to light, and then he used two words, life and immortality through the gospel. The word life is the Greek word sozo, okay? And it means of the quality of life that belongs to the resurrected Christ, okay? So there's a reason he uses two words, sozo and aftharsha. I'm ringing. Can we get rid of that? I want to sound, ama- I want to sound like Morgan Freeman. Or J- J- is it James Earl Jones? Is that? Everything the light touches. Okay. All right. So he says that the intention from before the foundation of the world was life and immortality. Life being a quality word, immortality being a longevity word, right? So he wants you to have a good life for a long time. This says that the antithesis or the, the problem, what, you, what would cost you the promise of life is if you live by the flesh. If you live by the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of of the body, you'll live, right? Good news. Okay, so the the title of this message is It Is Written. Now, if, like Paul, you had a choice between life and death, Paul said that to die is gain, but to live is Christ, okay? If I put Christ in a bucket and gain in a bucket, which bucket you taking? Christ, right? I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Not a crappy life for a little while, but the life that belongs to the resurrected Christ forever. Right? It's good news. Okay. John 3.16. I want to show you something. Um, In John chapter 3, verse 16, I want to explain to you why this man named Nicodemus came to Jesus. And I want to, there's, there's a lot of messages wrapped up in this message, but I want to tell you something about Jesus first. Jesus cares about your dignity. Did you know that? Right? So John chapter 2, they're at the wedding at Cana of Galilee. They run out of good wine. So Jesus makes good wine, and they dip it into the, the saucer, and then they take a cup of water, you know this, right, to the head of the feast. The feast master drinks it and said, man, this is the best stuff we've had all night. The only person outside of Jesus and the disciples that knew about the miracle of turning water into wine is the feast master. Jesus didn't do the miracle for attention. Jesus did the miracle to protect the dignity of one man. Okay? He cares how you look. Is that good? Okay. So it's important to set that up this way to understand that Nicodemus did not witness the miracle of turning water into wine. Nicodemus simply witnessed Jesus interacting with his disciples at a wedding. And he recognized that relationships and freedom are way better than bondage and religion. Right? So it wasn't the miracle that attracted Nicodemus to Jesus. He's like, I want me and my boys to interact like he and his boys. So I'm going to go away from my religious guys. I'm going to come to him under the guise of nightfall, and I'm going to ask him, what do I have to do to get what you got? Right? Think of, think of Nicodemus' position here, okay? He's not, he's not a, a beggar from the streets. He is a Pharisee of Pharisees, meaning he is a leader of religious leaders. He was likely very wealthy, very educated, and had lots of authority. And what he witnessed at a wedding with Jesus and his friends was enough to say, at the top of my religious ladder, I still don't have what that guy's got. Right? So Jesus told him what he's got. It's the kingdom. And he told him how to get it. He said, you have to be born again to enter the kingdom. That which is born of flesh is flesh. 
and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And you must be born, check this out, this is really important, of the water and of the spirit to enter the kingdom. Right? So he wasn't emphasizing one over the other. He was saying you have to have both. That he was saying you have to recognize that you have a birth from your mother that was necessary for you to function in the kingdom on earth. No body, no kingdom. You guys good? No body, no kingdom. You also have to recognize that divinity commingled with humanity and there is a portion of your identity that is literally a chip off the old block. It is divinity commingled with humanity. It is you being one spirit with Christ being thrust into a... I almost said a dirt bag. (laughs) A human body. (laughs) So that you can live out heaven's will on earth. You are the solution to the world's problems. You are the only thing on earth that has access to the kingdom, the dominion, the rulership of God. And he's saying, Nicodemus, if you want what I got, you have to recognize that you are as I am. You have to be born again. You have to recognize the divine component of your humanity, right? And check this out. And then he gives the evidence of what a born-again person functions in, okay? Mm. You all right? This thing. Check. Did you like that? Check. Is this good in the stream? Sound men, it's not your fault. It was digging into my jaw, and I don't want to be annoyed while I'm trying to give people good news. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 16. I'm going to read through this, and then we're going to get to the evidence, all right? Jesus tells Nicodemus that there's a difference in the way that divine humans function on earth. The difference is literally what distinguishes us from the rest of natural-born paradigm. It says this. Hmm. Did I say 316? We're going to start at the beginning. Chapter 3. We might not even get to 16. There was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher that came from God. No one can do these signs unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? See, his understanding is limited to natural lineage. That's a big problem. If you believe that you are what you were born into, you'll get what you always got, right? You'll reduce yourself to your lineage, your experience, and your encounters, and then you'll think, you actually shame yourself into being smaller and less significant than God intended you to to be. So Nicodemus' only understanding of being born, period, is being born naturally. So when Jesus tells him he has to be born again, he thinks he has to be born again naturally, but Jesus is giving him insight into the divine component of his humanity. The measure of the stature of the fullness of God that now dwells within him. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless is born of the water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. Do you want theology behind that, or do you want me to just get to my point? You want theology? You're an intelligent church, right? Okay, so it says, Unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom. There is only one species on earth that is permitted to function in and steward the kingdom of God on earth. It is a human being. Okay? Why is that important for you to understand? Because if you don't believe that human beings are the solution to all creation, okay, we're not waiting on a second coming, we're not waiting on uh, a rapture, we're not waiting on, we're waiting on the, the manifestation of sons of God. That's what Romans 8 says. Okay? Human beings. When God, when God delegated the stewardship of creation, he excluded spiritual beings from the picture. 
He said, let us make them in our image and let them have dominion. They were human beings, right? So Jesus is saying that human beings have access to the kingdom of God on earth. And because human beings have access to the kingdom of God on earth, you have to understand that your mother's water birth and your father's spiritual birth are what qualify you to function in the kingdom, right? <clears throat> That's what qualifies you to be governed by and function in another realm. Okay, get this? That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Here's the most significant part of this passage. The wind blows where it wants, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it came from so or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Okay? Sometimes that sounds mysterious, but this is one of the most practically applicable places that it talks about how, what it actually looks like to function in the kingdom. You are a human being with invisible origin that has visible results. Get it? You are like the wind. Say like the wind. Isn't that a Patrick Swayze, Swayze song? She's like the wind. Is that it? Okay. Patrick Swayze was talking about you, born again. Okay? Why is this important? Because wind has a way different function than waves, right? Waves are subject to wind, aren't they, Pastor? Yep. When the wind blows, the waves grow, right? Creation is affected by something that's invisible, and you can't tell where it came from. Okay? So are those who are born of the Spirit. That means you have an invisible origin. But because you are here, the things that are visible are subject to you. Okay? This is transfiguration. This is good governance. This is the difference between living a life of increase and a life of decay. They're like the wind. You don't know where it came from but you can see what it's doing, right? What pushes the wind around? Nothing. Try to stop it. It'll just go around you, right? It's going to get done what it desires to get done, okay? Now, in contrast, go to the book of James chapter 1. You're going to hate the context of this passage. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Okay? How many of you know who Chris Vallotton is? Chris Vallotton, in, in an interview, was talking about the students at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. And he said the feedback that they used to get about their students is they all have one major shortcoming. The major shortcoming is that they don't suffer well. Okay, this is, this is an issue, right? Because you can create a Christianity that's not real. Right? If you create a grace-based Christianity, which we are grace-based believers, but you might create a Christianity that is void of trials instead of a Christianity that brings you trials on purpose so that they can be put under the feet of the body. Right? The Bible says through various trials you'll enter the kingdom. The establishment of the kingdom on earth is by facing trials. Now, living by the flesh or living by the Spirit determines whether or not the trial kills you or you kill it. You get it? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, right? Not one, bunches. This is going to be good. We're going to talk about some stuff that you might get mad about, but it will help you, right? Do you know? <laughs> no, I won't go there. All right. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, let patience have its perfect work that you might be perfect and lacking nothing. 
Okay, the word patience in the Greek language means hupomone. Do you know what I hate about that word? It means to stand under something heavy for a long time. Who wants to be prepared <laughs> to stand under something heavy for a long time? If it's what you're called to do, then it's probably a good idea. If you are literally responsible to take territory for the rest of creation, if you are literally responsible to face trials head on so that they can end up under the feet of the body, then you better get good at standing under something heavy for a long time. And then it says that that patience produces a, that patience would produce a perfect work, that you would be perfect and lacking nothing. So perfection isn't the absence of trials. Perfection is to be able to be in them without them being in you for as long as you need to. Do you get it? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Ready for this? For he who doubts is like a wave. Get it? He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he would receive anything, anything from the Lord. He's double-minded and unstable. Do you understand? John 3.16 says if you're born of the Spirit, you're like the wind. If you're double-minded, you're like the wave. If you're born of the Spirit, you happen to things. If you live by the flesh, things happen to you. That's the difference. Okay? We have to get good at this. Romans 8 just said, if things happen to you, you'll die. If you happen to things, you'll live. If you live by the flesh, if you're governed by senses, if you're only ever as good as it's going, you will be manipulated and ripped around by whatever is trying to get under the feet of the body at that given time. Do you get it? They knock on your door to die. That's it. Death knocked on Jesus' door just so he could say, forget about it, buddy. Not today. You get me? You sure? I appreciate you all in the front row. That thing's usually empty. It makes me so sad. We had two more. Where'd they go? Oh, excuses, excuses. Ah, there's Nate. All right. Nadine is back there too? No, he looked beside him. No. All right. He was born of the Spirit is like the wind. If you're double-minded, you're like the wave. Which would you rather be? Okay. Like, this is, this is Jesus and James. James is Jesus' brother. They'd probably had conversations about this. So they understand that you can use this illustration over and over and over again and it never loses its relevance, right? Do you want to be pushed around or do you want to push things around? Do you want to govern things or do you want to be governed? That's the difference, right? Because if you are governed by the things that you're supposed to have in subjection, it will always cost you health. It will always cost you prosperity. The Bible says that you would prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. That means if things have access from your soul, from the outside, they will program the message that you believe. And you might think, rather than being in an ever-increasing kingdom, you're in an environment of decay. <clears throat> this is the gospel. Good news. Okay, now go to Romans 8. Nick, I heard you're a drummer. Tim told me you're a drummer. Is that supposed to be a secret? I won't tell a soul. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, 
But just so you and you alone know, we highly value musicians around here. But I won't tell anybody. Your secret's safe with me. And everybody that watches our live stream. Okay, help me. Where were we going? Romans, I want to tell you about my wife first. Okay, my wife's back pain started two weeks ago on a Monday. And she woke up, and just, just like everybody else, honestly, the first year we ever had the, the Legacy Academy, I forget how many years ago it's been, we all went around on the first day of the Academy and, and, and said what our goals were. And I said, I want, I want my knee-jerk reaction to be kingdom. I don't want to talk myself into kingdom anymore. Right? You know, if I'm short on Monday, I don't want to, or short on money, I don't want to f- be frantic and then remind myself that God will provide. I want to know immediately that God will provide. Right? I don't want to be in pain and then whine about it, but, but here's the deal. I still do. But success is having poor reactions for shorter amount of time. Right? Something can knock the wind out of your sails for months, or something can knock the wind out of your sails for minutes. The important thing is you remember who the wind is. Okay, that's good. Okay, so the team called my wife on the Monday that she was hurt, and my wife said one of the most profound things that I've ever heard her say, because we woke up, and both of us, because I've had sciatic pain since June, both of us now are in pain. You're a good man, Willie, thank you. And somebody said, Shanda, are you in pain? And she just looked over and said, I'm in control. The trial was still present, but she did not permit the trial to shape nor define her reality in the moment. I I live with a profound woman, which is why I get to preach profound sermons, because I just get to watch her overcome, and then I turn it into something that's repeatable. It's amazing. Are you in pain? She didn't even say no. She said, I'm in control, right? That's good governance. Okay. Romans chapter 8, you there? Verse 12. I'm going to break this one down for you, then we're going to show you how Jesus actually put this into practice. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. I want to define these words for you, okay? So when it says you'll die, that is the Greek word apothnesco. It means physical death. It means decay. It means anything that is worse tomorrow than it is today. Okay, so if if heaven is an ever-increasing kingdom, then participation with heaven should mean ever-increasing results, right? So the enemy of life, aftharsha, is apothnesco, ever increasing or decay. As a matter of fact, the definition of apothnesco is the body of a man exempt from decay. Okay, these are Bible terms. I'm not making them up. So it says, if you live according to the flesh, you will decay. Okay? But if by the Spirit you put to death, now that's a different word for death. It was thanato, which means dead to something. So if by the Spirit you make the deeds of your flesh dead to you, you will live. Okay? Do you know what deeds of the flesh are? Let's make this make sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slay a religious cattle real quick. Okay? You can't crucify yourself daily. You can't kill something that's already dead. Anytime that Paul talked about his death, he talked about it as though it was in his past. He, his, hmm. I have a lot of really smart people that watch me, so now I have to watch my terminology. Everything that he was never meant to be was co-killed, co-buried with Jesus. And everything that he was created to be from before the foundation of the world was raised and seated with him in heavenly places at the right hand of God. Okay? Good news. 
now. There is a process that Paul is explaining to the Romans that you can go through so that you don't have to live by the flesh. It is putting to thanato, making the deeds of your flesh dead to you by the Spirit. Deeds are a way of life or a habit, okay? It's not an identity. It's something that you learned because of something that you went through. Okay, it's super simple. It's not who you are. It's what you've learned to do. Okay, and you can reprogram what you've learned to do by being governed by the Spirit. Good news, right? So what you've learned to do in environments of trauma, what you've learned to do in environments of disappointment, what you've learned to do in environments of dysfunction, you can actually make them dead to you by living subject to truth. That's what Jesus did, okay? One of the things that we have to come to terms with with Jesus on earth is that he grew like you grow. Okay, when he was 13, he was asking questions. He wasn't teaching. And then it said he grew in favor and stature with men and with God. So he wasn't just popped out his divinity into a manger, though he was fully God. He had to come to the revelation of his sonship, just like you and I do. You guys okay with that? He didn't live a life that you can't live. He did everything as a man so that he could do it vicariously on your behalf and you could enter into what he's done for you. Good? You guys tired? All right. So Paul is saying that if you're led by the body, your body will kill you. But if you become dead to your body, your spirit will live. The word deeds was a mode of acting or a set of habits. Our flesh was crucified with Jesus on the cross. The faculty that stores the habits of your flesh is your soul. Often one of the most foundational teachings of the gospel is the most important. If we pass the words of Jesus off as rote or they become elementary, we won't be able to build spiritual foundations upon spiritual cornerstones. Okay, I'll, I'll explain that to you in the next passage. Are you guys following me? Okay. If you live governed by things, things will kill you. If you live by the Spirit, you'll overcome things. Your responsibility, the reason God gave you a body is so that you could overcome things, okay? Jesus' most fundamental teaching, I'm only going to touch this for a second, was he called his 12 disciples to him and he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his fathers and his angels, and he will reward each one according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, so he's tying it back to life and life abundant, right? But he's saying, if... You lose your life, you'll find it. If you get rid of everything that you were never meant to be, you'll find who you were always created to be. If you start living at justifying a victim mentality, you'll be able to live as the victorious son of God that you were always supposed to be. Good? Okay. Follow me. Pick up your cross. Right? It doesn't say die daily or crucify yourself daily. It says pick up your cross. Always in light, in the perspective of what you've joined with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. Now, I'm getting long-winded. I'm going to show you what Jesus did when he went into the wilderness, okay? Jesus went through the process that I just explained to you in the wilderness. Jesus didn't heal anybody before he went through the wilderness. Do you realize that? Jesus was filled with the Spirit. Then he allowed himself to be led by the Spirit. And then he was empowered by the Spirit. That means it's very different, excuse me, it's very possible for different people to have different experiences. D. 
depending on what you're willing to face and overcome. Good? Okay, go to Matthew 3. Matthew 3.13 says, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so this is a beautiful moment. I'm not going to go into the theology of everything that this meant, but what you can see is that the Father confessed an identity, an audible identity, an unmistakable identity over his Son, Jesus, right? This is my Son, and I'm pleased with him. Right? Immediately, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay? One thing you have to understand, as a matter of fact, I'm going to give you some some theology regarding the devil that will help you, but it may take you a while to contend with. Okay? The moment that Jesus became a positional son... He knew how God felt about him. The Spirit led him to circumstances where he would have the choice to prove it and believe it. Okay? Through various trials, you enter the kingdom. Consider it pure joy when the Spirit leads you to the devil. Okay? There is nowhere in the Bible that would indicate that Satan is a worthy opponent for a Christian. There is nowhere in the Bible that would indicate that you have to fight against the devil. Okay? Your Bible says that if you resist the devil, he runs away. Just don't listen to him and he leaves. Okay? The Bible says that there are three modes of warfare that you need to be cognizant of, and none of them have to do with demons or devils. There's only one enemy of God on earth, and it is your flesh's mind. That's it. So the very first commission in Genesis is God telling Adam to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, okay? So he was literally supposed to make everything on earth his subject, okay? Then one of the things that was supposed to be his subject came and spoke with him. Are you following me? Not his enemy, not his arch rival, not God's nemesis, something that was literally cast to earth as punishment to be trampled under the feet of human beings that look just like God came and fooled Eve into thinking that he was a worthy opponent. He was not supposed to be an opponent. He was not supposed to be an enemy. He was supposed to be a servant. Okay? Is that okay for your theology? 1 yeah. Corinthians chapter 5. We don't, I'm not getting into this. I know you're going to ask questions. Paul literally tells the church to use Satan to bring a man to maturity. Satan was working for the Corinthian church. Are you following me? Is this Okay. He's not an adversary. He's not a worthy opponent. 
Hebrew says, who are angels, but those who execute the commands of the recipients of salvation. It doesn't make a distinction as to whether or not they're the good ones or the bad ones. That saying is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> All I'm saying is that we've given him way too much credit. When, when his position from the beginning was to be placed in subjection to Adam and Eve... And as soon as Adam and Eve lost subjection of the devil, God came and said, listen, I'm going to bring a new man. That new man's going to come through the seed of a woman, and he's going to step right on your head again. Okay? I, I want us to have this in the right perspective. Okay? Because if, if we go on believing that, that we can make progress as long as this arch rival doesn't come and, and meddle in our affairs. We will be forever subject to the ebbs and flows of darkness rather than being governed completely and totally by light and then allowing darkness just to be put under his feet, our feet, when it shows up. Okay, does this make sense? Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 26 both are like spiritualized prophetic accounts of the punishment of that angel. And it said, you were in the garden of God, but I cast you down as a profane thing. And he casts him down and he ends up in Eden. Okay? He ended up in Eden because he was surrounded by human beings that were created freely, completely apart from their own effort, as everything that he strived to be. He could never be like God. And all he did was trade to try to become like God, and he never could. So he gets cast out to earth. Everything he wanted to be is now his master, and they did nothing to deserve it. Earth is hell for the devil. Do you get it? Unless he can convince you that you have to fight him instead of just ignoring him. Submit to God, right? This is governance. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Right? Is that okay? All right, Matthew 4. Man, I'm getting... Okay. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Like, this is the, the, the purpose of the Spirit's leading. The Spirit didn't lead him to cool waters. The Spirit didn't lead him to a carnival. The Spirit led him to be tempted by the devil. And when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now the tempter came to him and he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, so what did he just do? He tried to appeal to his carnality. He tried to appeal to his natural need. He had just fasted for 40 days. And in the natural, that might look like you'd be in a weakened state. In the spiritual, that means you're on top of things. Okay? You, have, you have understood that you get to govern from a different place. You don't have to have natural things to sustain a natural creation. You're a supernatural thing that now gets to eat word. Yep. So he positioned himself to be able to look at this thing and say, I don't need to eat. I'm sustained by supernatural word. Right? So he was confronted and he put it under his feet by saying it is written. Right? Okay. Then the devil took him up to, into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Ready? Let me show you something. Okay, what just happened to him in the Jordan? What voice came from heaven? And what did that voice speak over him? This is my beloved son. Right? What does the devil say? If you are his beloved son. Right? It's right on the heels. Right on the heels of you getting a revelation of sonship. It will be tested. It's being tested by the Spirit. Okay, don't get it twisted. It's being tested by the Spirit. God does not desire to leave you as a positional son. God desires to lead you into encounters where you can put to death the old truth of yourself so that you can stand as he is on earth, the truth of your identity. 
If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. It's written. Now he's using scripture again against him, right? He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, it is written, listen, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Okay? Now that you have a proper understanding of, of the position of Satan on earth, you realize that this passage is not about Jesus tempting his father. This passage is Jesus confessing his lordship as a human being over the devil. You get it? Jump off the building. Don't talk to me like that. That's what he's saying, right? Go kill yourself. Don't talk to me like that. I am your God. The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. He showed him all of the kingdoms of the world, and he said to them, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. What did he just do? I don't worship you. You worship me. Then the devil left. Yep. Did he have to fight? Did he have to rebuke? Did he have to cast spells? Nope. He put him in his place. He resisted him, and he left. Right? Now, something strange happened. There's two occasions that follow this occasion, and this is why it's so important for us to understand this. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? And then the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. By the way, baptistry is open. Yep. That's, that's my last-minute cue for my baptizers to get their swimming trunks on. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He goes th- through three trials, all of which he successfully places that trial under his feet. This is what it looks like to put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. The Spirit is leading him. The Spirit is governing him. The trial comes. The trial... You can almost hear the rubber going over him as he runs him over in his trajectory to sonship. It's good news, right? Okay, now, here's the point. Okay? You are filled with the Spirit as a believer. Period. Right? It says you're sealed with it. Like, on the day that you believe. From the beginning. Like, I won't even get into that theology. Whatever. Okay? If you're here, you're sealed. And if you're not here, you're sealed. If you're watching, you're sealed. Like, we won't get into that part. But here's the deal. What sealed you desires to lead you. And what leads you desires to empower you. Okay? So when Jesus got back from that wilderness, he healed every single sick person that he came in contact with. And the Father's confession over him changed. Do you realize that? In the Jordan, it was, here's my beloved son. I'm pleased with him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, it was, here's my beloved son. I'm pleased with him. All of you, listen to him. Right? He became a governor and not the governed. He became the authority and not the one that was in subjection. Because he was led by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. Is it good? Okay. I think I'm almost done. Oh, shoot. I'm going to make it almost. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I'm going to pick one of these next four to teach through. Okay. This is good. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You don't have to turn here. I'm closing with this. Miss Becca, you want to join me? Where is she at? Miss Becca, you're going to have to tell me your roommate's name or I'm going to call her Becca too. Carly? Okay. Everybody welcome Carly. They had, they had to get like five rows up before I realized it wasn't just two Beckas walking in. 
All right. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Spirit teaches. We compare spiritual things with spiritual things, but nat- the natural, natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's really important. Okay? His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're sons. Your flesh does not attest to that unless it's governed by your spirit. Your flesh will not give evidence. Your flesh will not get evidence of your sonship. Your body will produce evidence of your sonship. But if you're looking around for something to validate and verify that you're a son of God, you won't find it. That's what it means to live by the flesh. I need proof. I need validated. I need verified. A voice from heaven already spoke. That's all you need. Right? And that voice, listen, most important thing in the world, that voice is the voice that carried Jesus through the wilderness. The Spirit leads him to the devil. And it says, (laughs) if you are the Son of God. Okay, it wasn't necessarily about his it is written. It was about the fact that he was just baptized in the Jordan River and a voice came from heaven and said that I am the Son of God. It was that governance that enabled him to face the trial that tried to overtake him. But wait a minute. I know what my father said about me, right? The most important component of the gospel aren't the mechanics. We talked a lot of mechanics today. The most important component of the gospel is that you know what God already said about you. The most important component of the gospel is that you completely and fully understand that by loving you, he's loving himself, right? What, what husband ever hated his own flesh? That's what it says about God's love for the church. He can't hate you or he hates himself. He is so convinced of the union that the husband and wife have, that Christ and the church have, that, that his love towards you is actually love for himself, He won't not take care of you. He won't not nourish you. He won't not cherish you. But by neglecting you, he's neglecting himself. And no good husband ever neglected his wife. When he said, this is my beloved son, it inspired an environment that enabled him to say it is written until he got through the other side. When he got through the other side, God said, I've raised this one. Listen to everything he says. He put creation in subjection to a son that understood who he was because he was governed by the statement in the Jordan. He got to live by the statement on the mount. It was that good, right? This is wild. Okay, this is my favorite part. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Nor can he know him because they're spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Ready? Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Okay, that means you can't look around with your senses and try to find validation or verification of your sonship. You have to know who you are and judge appropriately. Nobody will judge you correctly. Don't try to find validation in other people's opinions of you. It's not there. Right? And then he quotes an Old Testament prophet, and then he kind of rebukes him a little bit. Paul says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Now, this is what your Bible says. I'm not making it up. If it's too good, it's too good. Who has known the mind of the Lord? that he can tell him what to do. And then Paul says, we do. What a bold message. What a bold revelation of union and oneness that he has with the Father to say, I don't know his mind, I have his mind. I haven't been given insight into the wisdom and intelligence of God. The wisdom and intelligence of God has completely permeated my being. And now the two have become one. So I don't know him because he told me. I know him because he lives in me. And everything that he has for life and godliness, he has given me freely. I want to encourage you. I hate trials. I hate trials. Somebody's counting. 
counting on you to put this thing that you're facing under your feet for them. Apprehending victory so that the rest of the body can walk in freedom freely. Amen? Is it good? Would you stand? I'm just going to pray over you. Baptizers, let's do this. Ooh, my hot wife texts me. She said nice things to me. I can't tell you what they are. It's church. No, I'm just kidding. So this is the second message, third message, after Pastor Aaron's of the Transfigured series. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain after his experiences in the wilderness. There was a generation of people that stayed in the wilderness for, well, 80 years. They failed once and then they tried again. And they didn't go through that so that you could go through a really long wilderness experience also. The Bible literally says, now this is where this is going to all tie together. And I apologize for this because it's kind of one of those like, oh, that sounded nice for 45 minutes. Now it hurts. Okay, so they went through the wilderness for 40 40 years. And then when they got to the promise, God turned them around and sent them back out into the wilderness. And then 1 Corinthians 10, it says that he led them this way as an example for you so that you would not fall prey to your carnal lusts and desires and go through the same thing that they went through. Here's the evidence. Here's the evidence that they were led not by what God said, but by what they saw. It says they were murmurers and complainers. That's it. The evidence that God saw that verified that they weren't prepared for the promise was what they saw became what they spoke rather than believing that what they what he spoke would change what they saw it's governance get it so Jesus redeemed their 40 years and 40 days by successfully overstepping every challenge that would come to him good stuff all right so uh, (laughs) go ahead give him a shout I would like to pray for you all now. If any of you are facing a trial that that you would like to now see differently, raise your hand. After this message, you want to put it in its proper perspective, okay? I want to pray over all of you that you face it well so that you can face it quickly. Then you can put put it behind you. And then you realize that the next time one of these things knocks on your door, it's knocking on your door to die, not to defeat you, okay? And that the church can walk in the victory that it's been promised from before the foundation of the world. So if you have something that you want to see that way, put your hand up. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this incredible body. I thank you for this amazing family and group of people. And I ask right now that this this message of transfiguration, this truth of life and abundance, permeate your body with no doubts. Father, that we would be the wind, not the ones that doubt and are double-minded that are like the waves. It said that we won't receive anything from you like that. But Father, let us live the sozo quality and aftharsha quantity of life that you've promised. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. All right.